I wasn't supposed to be driving that night. Pat was our designated driver, but they forgot about halfway through the night and started drinking heavily. I, having nursed the same cocktail up until I saw them getting red in the face and wobbly, knew my libations were then and there, and that their responsibility was now mine. I was annoyed, but since I hadn't intended on getting shit-faced that evening, I suppose Pat thought sobriety was wasted on them and figured I'd all but offered to take their place. In any case, once the night was done, I helped Pat and our friends, Cynthia and James, into the car and slipped into the driver's seat. Pat was mumbling something about what a great friend I was and got nothing but daggers from me in return. The other two passed out before they even buckled up, forcing me to lean over them like a mother to secure them in place. Was I this bad when I drink? Another flash of annoyance hit me. They could all sleep soundly, leaving me alone, having to stay alert and awake to play taxi for them. What's more, I wasn't so keen on driving specifically Pat home. See, there's this tunnel between their house and center town. And while it's just an ordinary tunnel, as far as everyone else is concerned, I can't stand it. It makes my skin crawl, because something that happened when I was a kid. Honestly, it scares the shit out of me. I usually take a different route, just so I can avoid it, but doing so adds an hour to the trip, and at two in the morning in a car that stank of crusted puke, I made the mistake of picking the tunnel. I want to be clear that when I said the tunnel scared me, I could never have predicted what happened that night. When I was a kid, my brother told me the tunnel was the mouth of a giant, and the only way to survive was to hold my breath the whole way through. Stupid, in hindsight, but kids believe the weirdest superstitions, so I held my breath until I couldn't. Until the world was almost nothing but darkness, with a few small spots of light. And then I let in the faintest of inhales and heard a shriek coming from the other side of the tunnel. I was convinced I'd made the giant aware of me, and now we were going to die. Can you imagine? Expressing the genuine, honest-to-goodness fear of death at that age. Now, of course, since I'm writing this, I didn't die in the belly of a monster. Instead... I hyperventilated with my hand slapped over my mouth, bracing myself for the worst. Until we came upon a wreck. Someone had lost control of their vehicle and had driven right into the tunnel wall. That was the sound that I'd heard. I didn't see a simple accident, though. Through the lens of a child's imagination, I saw the twisted metal as a car gnashed by the teeth of a giant. I saw the accident as somehow being my fault, all because I took a breath. I never wanted to go through that tunnel again after that. And if I had to, I held my breath the entire time just in case. As I got older, that fear morphed into an avoidance of the tunnel. Which leads us to this story. To me, pulling up along on the side of the road near the mouth of the tunnel with my three friends passed out in the passenger seats. I think I was more anxious than scared. Something about the way the wind moved through the entrance put me on edge. I could hear the howl even with the windows rolled up. I figured I'd wait for another car to drive in at first. It felt a little silly, but you know what they say. Safety in numbers. It wasn't long before a little Corolla passed me and was engulfed in the darkness. I hit the gas and followed behind, trying not to be too creepy about it. It was nice to see the taillights blazing the trail in front of me. I followed it to about the halfway point of the tunnel to the point where I used to start struggling to hold my breath. I could feel myself unintentionally holding it now. So far, it was going fine. I even started to relax a little. It was the calm before the storm. 
Suddenly, something weird happened. The car in front of me began to shrink as though it had violently sped up. I accelerated to give chase, not wanting to lose its light, but no matter how fast I went, the distance between us only grew. I couldn't hear the revving of its engine, and I couldn't understand why or how it was going so fast, so quietly. I kept shrinking, illuminating what seemed like ever-encroaching tunnel walls. I would have stopped and turned around if I wasn't sure it was only an optical illusion. Likewise, I would have turned around if I'd realized I should have been long out of the tunnel by then. Sometimes you miss the forest for the trees, and that Corolla was my tree. By the time the Corolla became a blip on the horizon, I realized I was white-knuckling the steering wheel. I stopped focusing on my convoy partner, slowed, and took in the surroundings. Where was the left lane? Gone, I realized. I was tucked between the narrow tunnel walls, with the roof so low, if I'd been driving a van, the top would have scraped against it. My first thought was that I'd somehow veered into a maintenance tunnel, and I was lucky I hadn't scratched Pat's car in the process. And then I noticed how dark it was. With the Corolla now completely out of view, and no hanging lights, I could only see as far as my headlights shined. Everything beyond that was pitch black, like in the deepest recesses of the ocean. I wasn't sure how far into the maintenance tunnel I was, nor whether it looped back to rejoin the main road. I didn't have room to turn the car around, and the thought of backing up the whole way filled me with a potent sense of dread. I didn't want to not look forward. Something told me I needed to keep my eyes on the road ahead. What was safer? The road not traveled? Or the road I could barely see because Pat cheaped out and didn't get LEDs for his taillights. I swallowed a knot of apprehension, imagining myself in the throat of the giant. I tried to open the door, but I found the walls so tight I'd only had room to squeeze one foot out. Had the tunnel gotten narrower? No. There was no way. I closed the door and decided to keep going. If nothing else, I hoped the tunnel would widen enough for me to turn at some point, but I took it slow, the tires crackling beneath me. There was movement in my peripheral vision, and my eyes shot to the side view mirror where I could have sworn I saw the concrete buckle behind me. I gripped my teeth and tried to shove Pat awake to no avail. I could feel my skin, every inch of it. It's like I was suddenly hyper aware of myself. It itched. Blood rushed to my head and I swear I could feel my eyeballs move. I needed to expand. And I needed to get out of this oppressive closeness. The walls were getting tighter. My throat was getting tighter. Breathing was getting harder. Was it my imagination? I smacked Pat in desperation, and although I wanted to try Cynthia and James, I couldn't bring myself to look in the back seat. I, I don't know why, but something in my gut told me if I turned around, I'd find a concrete wall encasing me in the front. I don't know whether it was stubborn or stupid not to turn around. I don't know if it was false hope or logic or fear. I have no idea what compelled me to keep going, even as I began to hear the scraping of metal on concrete. Even as my nails dug into the steering wheel and splintered, even as I gripped my teeth, trying to will the tunnel to release me. That's when I heard a slap. It was strong. Wham! Against Pat's door. When I dared to look, the blood drained from my face. There was something in the wall. Something coming out of the wall, more like. 
Rocky fingers attached the palms. Squeezing against the glass, the wall rippled like a wave and the hands rode it, giving chase. I sped up, not knowing whether I was being led like a lamb to the slaughter or closer to my salvation. The hands kept pace, following me at 80 kilometers an hour like it was nothing. The walls were getting tighter. I was entombed in darkness. The walls were moving. Solid, but malleable. Soft like liquid concrete, but when they hit the car, sparks flew. I realized I was screaming. I pushed down on the accelerator, testing the speed of the car. The hands followed. More hands. I could see them in the rearview mirror, in the side mirrors, in front of me. They were everywhere, scratching and tapping at the car, trying to get in. I was still screaming so loud, my throat turned to sandpaper. Faces began to pull away from the walls. Mouths and eyes and noses stretched out like shapes pushed through fabric. I couldn't tell whether I was still screaming or if the yowls I heard were coming from these concrete mouths. I just knew I needed to keep going. I needed to reach safety. I couldn't let them catch us. Catch me. Suddenly, I heard the familiar click of the door handle being pulled. Pat's door. In any other context, the sound wouldn't be so heart-stoppingly terrifying. In this one, it pushed me beyond the edge in a place so deep into the well of horror that I became almost numb. My nervous system couldn't handle the sensory and panic overload. I think it's resignation. I think the realm beyond fear is a kind of acceptance to your fate. To your inevitable death. It's a kindness your body offers you in the last moments of your life so that an imprint of fear isn't left behind when your soul leaves your body. Or maybe it's for your loved ones, so they can see that you died peacefully and can move on easier than if you kicked the bucket in wild thrashes of agonizing fear, begging for help and sobbing. Point being, when the door began to jostle open, I felt this wave of near calm and closed my eyes to let it happen. I took my hands off the steering wheel and slowly released the gas pedal. And then there was silence. There was no longer the grinding sound of metal on concrete, no screaming, no tapping or scraping or anything else like that. I opened my eyes in time to see the car puttering out of the tunnel finally, with the night sky blissfully far away and the tree line giving me a very wide berth. The false calm turned in relief. The relief soured into fear as I thought about what had just happened and it all sank in. You hear stories of injured people capable of incredible feats to save themselves, and the moment they reach safety they collapse. That was me, essentially. I drove the car a bit further down the road and then pulled off to the side. The stress had me shaking violently and I could barely get my legs out of the car. I fell on all fours. I must have looked like a drunk. As I reeled on the grass, I could hear Cynthia and James waking up and asking questions from the back seat trivial why are we stopped or where are we I couldn't care less what they were saying now I know what you're thinking the second I closed my eyes and accepted my fate I was freed from the tunnel it must have been all a bad dream or some weird allegory for dealing with my childhood fear You would be wrong. The car was scraped to all hell. There were dents in the metal shaped like large hands. And then there was Pat. Pat, the designated driver who got drunk and forced me to take their place that night. Pat, my friend since grade school. Pat, who for the duration of the tunnel had been unresponsive to my screams and shakes and pleas to wake up. Pat, 
who was dead. Their face twisted in abject horror as though they woke up just in time to see death coming for them. Pat, who hadn't had time to go through the stages of fear and reach that bliss before the end. The reason I now believe that the peace is more for everyone else's sake than one's own. Because I know they died screaming. I know exactly what they felt like in those final moments because I'd felt every rung from that ladder of fear, but I'd survived to tell the tale. Ultimately, Pat's death was ruled a heart attack. Officials think I fell asleep at the wheel, causing the car to veer into the wall before regaining control, which makes no sense. The scratches were on all surfaces of the car, even the undercarriage. But I suppose they were looking for an explanation, whether true or false. As for the tunnel, I don't intend to ever drive through it again. But from my research, I know one thing I didn't know when it happened. There is no maintenance tunnel. There's just the main road. Which means the only mistake I made that night was ever driving into the mouth of the beast in the first place. As I stood at the base of the long lane beneath, staring up at my distant destination, I suppose my perceptions of that house were being colored by my recent breakup. The plan had been to attend our studies in Prague together. Instead, I stood alone against the parching summer winds, studying a lengthy alley that carved its way up the precipitous hill with ancient laziness. Lost in brooding need for motion, I ignored my initial unease and slipped into the cramped canyon where the serpentine alley began. The walk was quiet, taxing, and lonely, but passed without note in a blur of regretful and nostalgic thoughts. I was in another country, but I'd not yet left the old one behind. As I emerged from the narrow shade, sweaty and bitter, the hill's crowning residence greeted me with a resurgence of disquiet. The high house had once been noble and sat apart towering over its environs like an aging patriarch with a tired back. The fourth and highest floor carried a visibly dangerous tilt toward the terminal precipice of that final lot, an illusion I attributed to the hill's steep angle and the stone's weathered patterns. Shadows streamed from sharp carvings, casting incomprehensible patterns across the wasteland of cracked medieval pavement that otherwise ran bright under dry winds. I was not the only student staying at the Moravec house, and this was hardly the first year that its surviving matriarch had hosted academics, but I still had to force myself to approach. An inexplicable revulsion held me back, trying to warn me away there was no specific reason I could gather to truly give up and return to my home country. And she was there, in my home country. Disquiet or no, I couldn't go back. I gave a gentle knock on the wide wooden door. An airy breeze brought a sigh past my ears. I looked back at the cobblestone lane, but the midday sun and patterned shade held nothing but emptiness and the odd tiny weed dancing in the wind. The door swung open, and I turned forward in a sudden embarrassed surprise. A white-haired woman stood waiting, a pleasant smile on her face. She carried a slight hunch to match that of a tired house itself, but her clear blue eyes still shined with a particular energy. Her calm and positive tone carried... Only a hint of an accent. Our last student, you've arrived. Lady Moravec, I responded, following the culture advice my advisor had given me. It felt odd to address someone with a noble like that, given that she stood before me in jeans and a faded orange shirt that seemed reminiscent of earlier decades. 
This was not an old woman. This was a woman who happened to have aged. Her deeply wrinkled face curled up in genuine humor. <laughs> Dear, really, call me Anita. She pulled a cell phone and typed in my name and details. So that I'll remember, she explained before returning it to her pocket. I stepped inside after her and immediately shuddered from the chill within. As she led me into the house, I saw almost immediately why she needed to record my details. Eleven other students sat in a long dining room. Lunch had finished at least an hour before, but the plates remained on the table while cultures clashed and friendships were forged. I was in no mood to meet people, and Anita seemed to notice. Instead of introducing me immediately, she showed me the way up a surprisingly narrow set of stone steps that I figured must have been for the servants, back when the house had employed them. The chill deepened as we climbed. Is it just you here these days? I asked, adjusting my backpack and holding myself closer against the drop in temperature. She kept moving but threw a smile back. If the cold's bothering you, I can get you a sweater. <laughs> no, I, I'm fine. I lied. At first I assumed the house's ancient construction kept it cold, but we passed a vent and the icy air brought me a shiver. I'd seen signs of modern renovations in the front hallway, and that was true here as well. We came to the top of the stairs and I blinked against the sudden change. White was the dominant color here. The long and close hallway was incredibly clean and populated only by a decorative little table with two plastic flowers and small vases. I immediately found myself thinking of the place as icy, given the painfully chill airflow rolling toward us and the harsh lack of color. Suppressing an oncoming chattering of my teeth, I forced a smile and followed her in my room. She had assigned me one at the end of the long hallway, because I had arrived last. That was fair enough, but I was already considering the walk back to the stairs, a trek that I would have to endure with each departure and return. The room itself was plain, spartan, and serviceable. There was no air vent within, so the temperature was higher and the patterns were all brown. Glad to escape the chill whites, I ducked within and dropped my backpack on the floor. A moment later, I thought to thank my new host, so I popped my head out. She had already left me to my own devices, but she had not departed entirely. I watched her open a nearly invisible white closet, pull out a vacuum, and begin cleaning the very scant dirt my shoes had left behind. I suppose it was necessary to keep the smooth alabaster wood floor clean, but something about her movement and manner came off as a bit intent, or even manic. Taking care to avoid any noise, I closed my doors and then went about assessing my new living quarters. The single window was made of thick, double-paned glass. Beyond, I could see a great deal of Prague and nothing of the winding lane I traveled earlier. The window faced the hill's precipice then, and I peered down at a dizzyingly steep series of rooftops that dropped haphazardly into a sea of buildings far below. Hoping for a better view down, I tried to open the window but found that it was set wholly into the wall. Not only could it not be opened, it had been constructed to purposely lack the ability. I suppose that was necessary to keep guests from falling out. There was no airflow in my room, however, so I wondered if it wouldn't begin to feel a little claustrophobic over the course of the semester. I suppose that I wasn't really intended to spend much time there. The house did have a sprawling layout that probably allowed for privacy through sheer size. Shredding off my continued unease, I headed back into the icy halls. I did see the narrow stairs back down to the front, but I also looked in the other direction. The hallway terminated at a junction, where a fancy portrait hung on the wall. I approached it, studying the image of an older and respectable man. His heavy eyes gazed internally at something in the distance, and I knew instinctively who this was. Rasta Moravec, the man of the house, and Anita's late husband. 
I'd been told not to bring him up. Standing there in front of the picture, I pulled out my phone and looked at him. His respectable portrait seemed to sham as I read paragraph after paragraph about the scandals of his life. There had been rumors about gambling, about successful shady dealings to recover family wealth, and about womanizing. The article also included an image of a woman I recognized. It was Anita, lacking a number of decades, and quite beautiful for the change. She stood with her husband, smiling with that same particular brightness. I stared, at first because she caught the eye so strongly, and then because a strange shock ran through me. It was brighter, but much less warm, but I knew the pattern. She was wearing that same orange shirt. It was a picture of the two of them, from before all the scandals. I supposed that shirt meant something to her. A subtle sigh reached my hearing. I looked up, confused. Had that been the same sound from outside? The revving of the vacuum startled me, and I hurriedly put my phone away as Anita's swift cleaning motions brought her closer. She kept her eyes on the traces of dirt I'd left out on the sheer white floor. Please, join the others downstairs. I did as she asked, wondering if I hadn't heard a slight tone of anger in her voice. The other students pulled me in from the first moment, demanding my story and friendship, and I gave them what I could. They were nice enough, but my mind was still on a girl I knew I would never speak to again. That and the oddness of the house and its sole caretaker. School started. And I had less time to think about it, but nobody else seemed to find it odd that she wore the same orange shirt every single day. She kept it immaculate, just like the house, so the others chalked it up to her being set in her ways. I heard that same odd sigh twice more over the next three months, but I imagined it had to have come from the air system. Because my room was unsuitable for walking pursuits, I often wandered the house and eventually found a library. In addition to a huge range of first print classics, there was also an entire section filled with medical texts. Each had been leafed through in great detail and written upon with intent. Notes mirrored almost every margin. They were a bit odd, but close enough to modern. I'd intended to ask Anita about them until the nature of the notes changed. You bastard. It was probably my tenth time pursuing the dusty and unused library, and my third time examining those medical books, so I had to stare for a moment to comprehend what I was seeing. Someone had jotted questions above and then answered them. Someone had noted important sections below, between, you don't get to leave me, I'll find out who she is, I'll find out who all of them are. I swallowed down a return of that unease I'd felt my first day, and then carefully placed the books back the way I'd found them. I kept my thoughts to myself for a time, and only perused my concerns in a roundabout manner. The twelve of us had finished dinner, and a few glasses of wine had been had, courtesy of our absent hosts. I knew who would speak most freely. Wright was an American, and the drink went straight to his mouth every time. At an opportune time, I leaned in close to him and said, Say, do you know anything about how Rasta died? His dumb grin told me I'd struck gold. He gave me a conspiratorial whisper that I was sure everyone in the room could hear. My only saving grace was their drunken conversations had them riveted to other topics. Rasta Moravec, Wright let out with a burst of air, and gave a great nod. <laughs> Disappeared. Disappeared? I asked, a terrible suspicion coming over me. Not going to find that on a Wikipedia, are you? Heard it from a local chick I hooked up with my first week here. Only the locals know about it. Whisper it, you know. I tried to sound only casually interested. When did he disappear? Ten years, I think, he responded before leaping up. Bathroom time. 
He was gone in an instant, but a dark heaviness remained in his absence. I took my leave and headed to my room, cramped though it was. I sat between close brown walls, staring at my sealed window. What had Anita done? I absently bit through each of my nails, one by one, before I decided I had to investigate further. The main complication was clear. Lady Moravec never left the house. She loved the house and kept it chill, austere, and mattingly clean. That gave me the idea. During another night of drinking, I gave Wright an anonymous gift. A potted plant, something which he found uniquely hilarious for reasons beyond my ken, and he proceeded to almost immediately trip and smash it. Exactly as I'd hoped. Anita raced out from rooms unknown and proceeded to clean in a panic. I slipped away. Her room lay at the very back of the house, and I hurried toward it without my shoes. In socks alone, I left no trace of my passage on the stark floor. The door to her room creaked open with a blast of icy air. I braced myself for the coldest room yet and crept inside. Everything within was white. The bed and all of its sheets were white. The desk was white. There was no window at all. I'd seen many of the signs, but I knew now that Lady Moravec contained some measure of hidden madness. This simply wasn't normal. The desk drawer slipped open without resistance, and I leafed through several white journals I found within. He loves me. I'm so happy to have my Rasta with me. I checked the corporate text at the very front of the journal. It was only two years old. Either Anita was completely mad, or... When that sigh broached my senses for the fifth time since I'd come, I finally heard it for what it was. A distant, weak, and hopeless moan. The truth struck me with an almost physical thump to the chest. Rasta Moravec was still in the house. Electrified by my new understanding, I began looking around the room with sharper eyes, like the closets in the hallways, nearly invisible white doors that had just been set into the walls there. They were set high, near arm level, and too small to be accesses to another room, but I was still deadly curious. I approached one and slid the clean white wood panels apart. An empty cube of space sat beyond, also bright white, except for a single crimson little splatter. A drop of blood sat in that cupboard, and it had not yet congealed. It was fresh. A creak sounded in the distance, and I hurriedly closed the cupboard, checked the desk, and slipped back out. The house's maze-like setup lent me a dozen paths to escape. I made it in my room, put my shoes back on, and then casually rejoined the dinner party in the dining room. Nobody had been the wiser. If anyone had thought about it, I would have told them I'd just gone to the washroom. I laughed along with their jokes and listened to their tales, but my mind was solely on the undeniable fact that something terrible had been going on in that house for ten years. Was Rasta locked up somewhere? Was Anita torturing him? Burdened with my horrible suspicions, I couldn't help but feel completely alone. The girl I loved should have been there to help. She would have known what to do. She'd been bright, strong, and smart. I didn't understand why we'd ended, and I was far from over it even months later. And winter was coming on, so my time spent in the house only increased. I used every moment of free time manipulating dirtiness in the house so that I would have a chance to explore each and every room one by one. If Rasta was in the house, there had to be a way to find him. I couldn't simply call the police. 
that had all been done 10 years ago, apparently, and they'd found nothing. Without any evidence, I'd look insane. My search took me deep into the inner workings of the house, most especially in my own room. After several days of work, I'd managed to remove a panel in the wall without damage. Beyond ran a great many wires, tubes, and so on. Those things I expected. There was one deviation from those expectations. Several little glass tubes that ran from somewhere deep in the wall to somewhere else deep in the wall. Extremely small fibers sat within each. I stared at them for days and even purchased a magnifying glass, but all I saw was dirty yellow with the traces of red. What thin fibers would be yellow with the traces of red? I looked up wires, manufacturing, house hardwares. I couldn't find a match. But these tubes were a clue. I focused my explorations on the numerous hidden panels in the house, tracing the glass. Many spread out in branching patterns through the walls, often terminating into hundreds of very small glass tubes. What was I seeing? I still had no idea. I traced them to the other direction, finding that they got fewer in number and thicker as I headed toward the heart of the house, Moravec. By then, I'd grown used to the internal bone chill and felt one with it. This house, this environment, carried a bleak madness that I knew had infected me. Anita had become obsessed with keeping her womanizing husband, and I had become obsessed with freeing him from her. Anything to keep me from thinking about what was missing in my life. A major break occurred late December of that year. I hadn't gone to class in the last month. I needed time to continue my search. I was glad for it, too, because it was during one of those hours that I was supposed to have been absent in the house that I finally found something important. It was a closet within a closet, containing a hidden apparatus that pumped in and out like some sort of lung. The thickening tubes connected to it directly, and I managed to determine that this air system was separate from the icy air vents. My immediate thought was that she was keeping Rasta somewhere isolated, with its own environment. That would have avoided a number of problems that would otherwise have exposed his presence in the house. She was smart. I'd guessed it, based on her study of the medical text. But now I knew. Those manic and sharp blue eyes hid piercing calculation. I knew that now, too, because I had the sense that she was on to me. I hadn't given myself away, and I'd made no mistake, but she seemed to see it in me somehow. Did madness recognize madness? She made no immediate move against me. I hesitated for a few days out of fear, but then resumed my search when I felt I had no other choice. I mapped out the entire house and found no missing space. The entirety of House Moravec was drawn out in my hidden notes, and there were no extra rooms. I even rented a sounder and gone over every inch of the basement. It was that drawing that struck home the horrifying truth of what I'd been mapping. I stared at it, highly aware of everything around me. My brown room hummed quietly with the systems around it. Snow fell outside the window, and I was holding a picture of something I recognized. There was no more need for the game. In a shaking fury, I stormed through the freezing white hallways, heading straight for Anita's room. She sat within, writing in her white journal. She looked up with icy determination. I see from the look in your eyes that you understand. I shook with the strain of repressed violence. Show me. Her hunch disappeared as she stood up straight with ease and grace. An affection. Another lie. She moved to the cabinets in her bedroom walls and opened the one I'd found the drop of blood in. 
Are you sure? I kept my response quiet, but fierce. Show me. She pressed a hidden square, and the cubicle space lifted. It had always been a sort of secret dumbwaiter. I never thought to look deeper into it, because the space was so simply too small for a person. It was the perfect size, however, for the head of an aging, womanizing patriarch. The glass tubes moved with a mechanical case that came up. I understood now what had been done. Anita turned around and looked at me and smiled. He could never leave me. It was what I'd expected. The tubes had been mapping and had been splayed out like a circulatory system, and I'd found the lungs. Rasta had never been in any room of the house. He'd been in the house itself, splayed out through every wall and floor. The tubes held his arteries and veins, and this box held his head. I hadn't expected, however, that the system had actually worked. Rasta Moravec was still alive. He stared at me, trying his best to whisper for help. Lady Moravec studied me with a bright gaze. Are you going to call the police? I shuddered. I have to. This is monstrous. Insane. Anita, do you see what you've done? She gave a slow nod. He can never leave me or this house. I have everything I want. She took a step closer. Before you inform anyone, I should tell you. I've invited your ex-girlfriend, the one you always talk about. She'll be coming here for the next semester. You could simply keep this to yourself and stay. The house will need someone to take care of it after I'm gone. Before that, I could help you learn. I froze, trying to comprehend what she was offering. She, too, had a partner who had disappointed her in trying to leave. But she'd taken away that disappointment through... Science and madness. When I didn't respond, Anita moved to her desk, pulled out a medical textbook, and held it out. I'd like to say I turned it down. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed tonight's stories. The last one was a bit wild, to say the least. Um, as far as a question for tonight, I'm not going to ask you if you have someone's head in a jar, because if you do, I don't want to know about it. But I am curious as to what urban legends you believed when you were a kid. Given the the first story mentioned the urban legend of like holding your breath while going through a tunnel, I've always heard that you need to hold your breath while passing a cemetery because you don't want the spirits to make their way into your body or <laughs> something absolutely insane like that. Um, I don't believe that. I don't really believe in a lot of superstitious superstitions, anything of that nature, to be honest. But I am curious to see what you believed when you were a kid. Nowadays, I don't necessarily believe in things like Bloody Mary or anything of that nature, but I'm definitely not going to try it to see if it actually works, if that makes any sense. Um, growing up in rural North Carolina, we didn't really have a whole lot of urban legends in my area. Um, but I'm interested to hear if your state, wherever it may be, has any interesting urban legends. I'd love, love to read about it, maybe write about it for a video. Who's to say? So leave that down in the comments below. And while you're writing your comment, I'm going to take some time to thank all the $5 patrons and members. 
Thank you to Absent Alice, Amethyst, Amet, Bubbly Panda, Caroline, Christina Smith, CT, Deborah Tychus, Elizabeth Watkins, LSG, Furious Weasel, If in Doubt, Flat Out, Jennifer Dameron, Jesse Jess Jess, Justinia Zaromsky, Karen Parrott, Kat, Kathy Fanning, Lee Riggs, Laura, Lindsay Pruitt, Melody Evans, Melissa Berwick, Mindy Bannon, Moon Potato, Nicholas Moore, Nora, Nova Nocturne, Patricia Rodea, PJ Masks, Ray Clegg, Sentinel, The New On Gum 24, Tiger Princess, Tish Love, Triumph, and Victoria Step. Thank you all for the amazing, amazing continued support. I really, really appreciate it. And thank you to everyone who stops by and listens to the stories. I appreciate you all just the same. I hope you all have a wonderful day, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are. And as always, take care of yourselves and everyone around you. Good night, everyone.